Okay, welcome back everybody. A um, little bit different of a video today. As you're looking at, we got some graphs here. This is gonna be a follow-up to the previous video I did where I explained my mentality behind investing. And part of that is the way that I track my performance and as my portfolio grows, the, the major indicators that I track. And what that is mostly is my income, how much income it's generating month over month and the compounding it's, I'm gonna get from that and the rate of growth and all that good stuff. Now, what you're looking at here is a Google spreadsheet I'll put a link in the description of this video that you can check out right now and click on it and open it up. And then you're going to be able to follow along and I'll show you how to plug in your own data so that instead of seeing all my numbers, you can actually plug in your own data and see how you're doing. And these visualizations will update to show your data. So first of all, I know this, I mean, we're seeing a lot of rows and columns just full of numbers here. It all looks very complex and messy. It's really not. You don't have to really do a whole lot. You plug in one line of data and the rest is all automated formulas. And then beyond that, updating is literally the click of a button. So I'll show you that. Don't get intimidated by looking at all the numbers here. They're just to have them displayed there. It's very simple though. So I'll be able to walk you through it. First, I wanna give just a condensed summary again of why I view my investments this way, why I'm actually tracking my portfolio this way. If we go to my portfolio here, there's a lot of things to look at. You have all these different numbers here. All the different sectors are performing differently. Some of them are in the green, some of them are in the red. On a monthly basis, my portfolio goes up or down depending on the market. Like in the last 30 days, I'm down $327. And then, you know, this week I'm down. Over the quarter, I'm up $867. And it just, it can become difficult to get a bearing on how you're actually doing. And one of the indicators that I've always talked about is the market gain is very tough to see as an accurate indicator, I think, of progress because this can swing up and down every single day, and it does, and every single month and every single year. It's hard to tell if you're actually making any progress. Another thing, if I go to the activity feed here and I scroll down, you see all these dividends and deposits and trades. There's a lot going on here, and sometimes it can be a lot to look at. So what I wanted to do was simplify all of this and give a couple things that I think are really easy to track that give you a general sense of how you're doing. And that is these graphs, they mostly track your income. And that is what your portfolio is producing month over month. You can call it dividend income. It, I mean, some of it's dividends, some of it's interest. I don't really care what you categorize the money as coming to me, but this is income. Everything that my portfolio is producing month over month, I wanna see if that's growing or shrinking. Um, if that's growing, I think that's a good indicator that your portfolio is growing, that your compounding is gonna be growing. And that's what I'm gonna be tracking with mine. Okay, so let's jump right in with the instructions. The first thing that you're gonna to wanna to do is copy this Google Spreadsheets to your Google Spreadsheets. So what you wanna to do to find this and open it, it's in the description of this video you're currently watching. So let me show you uh, where I'll put it. Here's the previous video that I have, and it has all these links underneath in the description. You can hit show more, show less. Right there at the very top, underneath my name, it'll have a link to this Google Spreadsheet. You click on that and open it up. Then it will bring you to this. It'll look just like this. And before you start trying to edit this, you're not gonna be able to. This is closed off for editing. This is the one that you need to make a copy of, and I'll show you how to do that. So to make a copy, you go all the way to the very top left here, click on File. Then in File, you hit Make a Copy. It'll have this pop-up asking you what you wanna name it. You can name it whatever will be best for you to remember. I'll go OK. And there we go. Now we have our own copy. Copy of Joseph Carlson Show Dividend Income Tracker. So we have our own. This one we can edit, and this is the one that we should use. The other one uh, that just says Joseph Carlson Show Dividend Income Tracker, you should probably delete that one because it's not gonna do much for you. You can't edit it, it just is there to view. Uh, but this is the one that you'll be working with. So now that we have this one, what we wanna do is plug in our own data. On M1 Finance or any broker really, they have a monthly statement. Those monthly statements correspond to these months right here. Every month I look to see how much I earned in dividends and then I plug it in right here. That's where it gives all these different calculations. What you wanna do is find those monthly statements and then be able to have all these numbers. For every month you've been investing, how much did you earn in dividends? That's really the only information you need. This doesn't calculate your portfolio size or anything else, just your income. Now what we need to do is update this data so that it matches your data. 
And the only column that you really need to update is this monthly dividend amount. That's the only one that you focus on. All these other ones are automatically calculated. They're just there to display for you. The issue is, is that I started investing January 2018. That's my first data point. A lot of you are going to be starting at different points. You might have started in September 2018, or you're just maybe barely started and you started in March of 2019. Let's go ahead and pretend that I started in October of 2018. If I started in October right here, let me zoom in a little bit. I don't need all these prior months, right? So what I'm going to do is show you how to get rid of these prior months. It's really simple. You select from here to September because we, we want to start at October. So we're selecting all the months prior and then you right click, gives you a lot of different options here. You hit delete rows 10 through 18 this number will be different if you select a different month. So it might be like 10 through 15 or 10 through 20 or something like that. But you don't hit the delete columns, you hit the delete rows. And boom, it's gone. Now what will happen is all the formulas, everything will automatically adjust and still look good, but it does screw up the graphs a little bit. And I'll show you how to, to fix this. It's actually really easy. So since the rows are deleted, these all shift upwards. What you need to do to fix this is really easy. You just hit this, I hit shift, and then I drag these back down and then this one I just drag it back down and that is all you do now it's looking good you have the right amount of months but the data is still not correct right so we want to plug in the correct data here now this part's pretty easy because if you have this data going forward let's say that I started investing in October and all this data is wrong to update this data the monthly dividend amount is really easy you just go in and you literally you double click on it and let's say that I started off with like eight dollars the next month i had seven okay so i'm gonna go and pretend that i had eight dollars seven ten fifteen twenty four twenty thirty two twenty eight twenty five now what you can see happen if i zoom out a little bit is you can see these graphs start to update they update to reflect all these numbers the first one right here that's eight dollars and then it goes up to 28 and likewise, this one goes through and, and does the same as updating. This graph shows you the gradual increase in your projected income based on the, the rate of growth. And as you plug in more data points, it'll update. Now that we have that part done, I wanna show you how to update the next month as if we're going to do that. What you'll do is we're in June right now. Let's fast forward one month, say that we're in August and that we wanna plug in July's numbers. We just entered into August, we have July's statement and we wanna enter that in. Let's say that we made uh, $36. So I'll go to the update sheet button. This is what we're going to use. What you do is you select the month, the year that you want to update, and then you enter in the amount. So if I want to update July 2019, and I'll enter in the amount 35, I believe I said. And then what this will do is the first time that you use this, it uses some uh, JavaScript that I wrote, just a, a single function that all it does is it finds these cells and it throws in the number. But because it's custom code, it's JavaScript, Google makes you go through a bunch of these scary warnings alerting you that, hey, this is JavaScript, you know, we're not sure what it does. It's not like an approved app that went through our store. So I'll show you what that looks like. You click the button and then it runs this script here. And then what will happen is after the script runs, it takes a little bit longer the first time than any other time. What will happen is it'll say authorization required. A script attached to this document needs your permission to run. And then you have to go through a couple screens. You only have to go through these once. So you hit continue. It asks you what account you want this to be tied with, which is just, I just select the Gmail account I'm currently using. This one right here. This app isn't verified. This all looks very scary. Uh, again, it, it just says that this has custom code that I wrote running. If you don't trust me or don't want to use it, that's fine. I won't feel bad, but you have to go through this once if you do. So you hit advanced right here, this little link, and then it brings down this. It says go to add month. That's the name of the function there. And click on that. And then it will just ask you allow is the last thing. So if I hit allow, we'll see this run. And boom, you can see that the graph automatically updated. The new number in July 2019 was updated 35 and then all the formulas automatically adjusted. So if I zoom out, you can see that July is the current month. $31 is the average. The actual is $35. And it's that simple. Now that we have permission to run that code, I could go like this and I could go, I could go to August here, 2019, and I could plug in and say that I made $42 and I'll hit update sheet and you can see this graph update live. 
there we go. You can see that it updated without us doing anything. All three of these graphs updated. So we have August here, August here is updated, and then August here is updated as well. That's pretty much it. Anytime that you actually want to go in and add in a new month, as time goes on, you literally just select the month, select the year, put in the earned income, and the graph will automatically update. You don't need to do anything beyond that. So hopefully that's easy enough. The first time it's a little bit more difficult to set up, especially the update sheets thing. Google kind of makes you go through a lot of screens there uh, when you run anybody else's code on a Google Sheets project. But other than that, I think it's pretty simple. Updating it month to month is really easy. Gives you a, a pretty good idea of what your projected income is based off of previous months. And I'm gonna be using this throughout the show to, to show the progress that I'm making as well. Just as a side note, to be able to access this, after you close this window, you go to sheets.google.com and it will show up as the name that you have in the top left corner there. So you can open it up anytime. All right, so I am gonna answer some questions in this video as well. These are a few that I got in just the past couple of days. I'll go ahead and go to the first one here. This is from Donald, this is on Instagram. You can follow me at Instagram, there's a link in the description. He says, I recently started M1 on July 1st. I just noticed that you have everything categorized. My portfolio has 36 companies under one slice. I'm guessing it's too late since I heard other YouTubers say selling will contribute to your taxable event. If I want to add more companies without having to reduce the percentage of each company, is it better to start another portfolio to just create a new portfolio? No, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't just create a new portfolio. There are things that you can do. This is going to be a solution to this problem, but it's a little bit tedious of one. And I'm actually doing something similar right now in my portfolio. So let me show you here. I have a, a couple different buys and a couple different sells going on. Well, one different buy and one different sell going on. If you look right here, these little arrows pointing left and right, right here and here, mean that there's an individual buy order and sell order. Like if I click into my finance pie here, I'll show you what's going on. So United Health Group. This is, it's technically a healthcare company. It's, that's the sector that it belongs to. If you went to like Yahoo Finance or Seeking Alpha, it would say it's a healthcare company. Now I've had it sitting in my finance pie for some time because my logic behind it was, yeah, they're technically a healthcare company, but their primary product is insurance. And so I felt like that's more like a financial product. But over time, they've been picking up actual more healthcare specific stuff that outside of finance. And so I, I believe that they are even moving towards more of a broad healthcare company. And I'm putting this holding right here, I'm switching it out of the finance pie into my healthcare pie. The way to do that is pretty simple. It can be difficult if you have 36 companies you're doing it with, but with just a couple, it's pretty simple. You go into the holding that you wanna move. So I'll click into this. You do an individual sell order on this, and then you sell the total amount that you have. So $315 is how much I have of this company. I did a sell for the exact amount to the penny. Then what you do, is you go to where you want to add it. So I went to healthcare here. This is where I want it to go. I edited this pie. I added in the holding. You can see it has no funding right here. And I added in United Health Group. And then what you do on this is you do a buy order for the exact dollar amount. And what that will do is that total amount, that $315.74, will move over from the previous pie into this one. Once that's completed and once this goes through today, I'm going to go back into the finance pie. I'm going to hit edit. And then I'm going to remove this out of there. Boom. And then it will get rid of that holding that doesn't have any money in it anyway. Okay. So the next question is another one I got on Instagram. Uh, he says, I've got a $10,000 portfolio, $10,000 plus portfolio on M1, and I'm adding to it steadily. Rumors about a recession keep circulating, possibly in 2020. And I'm wondering if I should hold money back to buy the dip and average down if it does. I'm also a little nervous if the recession is severe that some of my holdings will cut the dividends. What's your process for handling that too? My portfolio has a lot of the same holdings, by the way. Okay, so you have a few different questions there. I'm gonna go through and break this down. The first one is uh, you're saying there's possibly gonna be a recession in 2020. Should I hold back? Should I try to buy the dip? A lot of people say, hey, that's market timing. You know, you should just invest. And if you're in it for the long run, you shouldn't try to play that game. Now, I think that there's some better ways to handle this. I think there's two main lines of thought. One of them is you do the uh, Ray Dalio all weather portfolio version where you construct a portfolio where you literally don't have to look at any market indicators. It's just built to go through any type of environment. You never have to edit it or do anything and it will do okay on the upside and it will do okay when there's a recession. That's one thought. 
The next is where you don't completely ignore market indicators, where you look at uh, if you should try to be a little bit more conservative, if you should try to be a little bit more aggressive. If we are coming out of a recession, uh, prices are really cheap, PE ratios are extremely low, that's a time where you probably should be a little bit more aggressive. And on the contrary, if PE ratio is pretty high, like it is right now, the PE ratio for the S&P 500 is higher than it historically has been. And if there's a bull run for like over 10 years, like there is right now, you might want to gauge things a little bit more conservatively. That's the approach I've taken more of. What I've done is I'm not timing the market. I'm still investing, but I'm noting that, you know, there is a heightened chance of recession when we've been on a bull run for 10 years. We have the yield curve inverting. We have record low unemployment. There's just a lot of historical indicators that show that we could face some challenges coming up. Now, Again, I'm still invested, but I move forward a little bit more cautiously. That's the approach that I'm taking. That's why I have bonds in my portfolio, even though I'm relatively young and I have a long investment horizon. I have bonds because I, I think we should be more cautious right now. That's another reason where I focused mostly on a blend of large cap S&P 500 value companies that pay dividends. I think that those are a little bit easier to hold. They're a little bit more resilient in recessions than other companies. Now. A couple things to note with this. You have to have your expectations set correctly. If there's a 30% recession or 40% pullback, um, my portfolio will probably fall around the same amount. The reason why is because everybody owns ETFs now. When you own ETFs, you own everything. Uh, you own the whole world. You own S&P 500. And when you sell out of it, you don't pick and choose what companies to sell. You sell everything. You sell good and bad companies. So when you individually pick companies and everybody's selling out of ETFs, those companies are going to go down with those indexes. They're going to go down just the same amount. So a lot of good companies that I own during the next recession will get their valuation cut down a lot. That's just something you have to expect to happen. No matter how good of companies you pick, a lot of them are going to get their valuation greatly reduced during the next bear market. Another part of your question, you asked specifically about the dividends, if they cut their dividends. Uh, another thing you have to realize, and I know this is a difference between individual stocks and ETFs. So when you have an ETF, a lot of times it's easier to hold mentally because you're not the one going in and doing the dirty work of doing the turnover, meaning you're not adding and removing companies from that ETF. Uh, just know that that's happening in the background. Every ETF updates itself either like every six months or every quarter, and that's called turnover. What they'll do is they'll remove holdings. Like if you have VYM, you know, a dividend paying ETF, companies are cutting or slashing their dividends all the time. And VYM is removing those companies and adding in new ones that do pay dividends. So that's been happening in the background all the time. You're just not filling it because you're holding an ETF. So there's some benefits of holding an ETF there because you don't have to deal with it. When you have your individual holdings in a portfolio and one of them cuts their dividends, I mean, it's it's a lot easier to take it a lot harder because it's like I handpicked this company and it cut its dividend. You know, I, I made a mistake here. You're not going to get them all right. In a recession, a lot of them are going to cut their dividends. So that's pretty much how I'm handling it. I built my portfolio so that I'm comfortable going into whatever market environment we have. If we do get into a huge bear market, a huge recession, I might be a little bit more careful about the companies that I sell. I'll probably only sell ones that completely get rid of their dividend and keep ones that just reduce it a bit or try to hang on to it. All right, the next question is from Zerne. He says, hi, Joseph, what do you think of sin stock like Altaria and Philip Morris? Are they safe dividend companies? Uh, so what do I think of the stocks, Altaria and Philip Morris? I don't love the products that they sell. That's why, partly why I don't own them. Uh, I don't love cigarettes. I mean, I think one of the few things that you should invest in in your life is your body, keeping it healthy. Uh, I mean, that's the only thing you really truly own is your body. And so um, I don't love the product. I mean, cigarettes, I've never seen the purpose in them. They just are addictive and destructive to your body. Uh, the same kind of thing with e-cigarettes and uh, vaping. I don't know if it's quite as bad. I haven't really looked into it, so I'm not making I'm not making any statements on it. But my guess is, is it's not great for you. And any of that stuff I don't think is super good for you. And so besides that part, I mean, that's part of the reason why I don't own them. But there's other concerns I have as well. So one of them is I feel like there's this pattern that will be followed over time where cigarettes were cool for a while, where uh, people did it. It was the social thing to do. And then as health concerns came out and studies came out, uh, it showed that they were really unhealthy. People slowly stopped 
smoking. Now, if you smoke, you're, you're kind of like a pariah. I mean, they don't even let you go into buildings or go anywhere. You have to sit outside and do it. It's, it's kind of an antisocial thing, right? It makes it harder to be social. So all the benefits of it that you could say in the past were lost with cigarettes. Uh, and I feel like the same thing will, will happen with vaping. I feel like it's it, it's new, so it's something that's cool and funny. There's lots of memes about it and, and on social media and things like that. As time goes on, I think that it'll become less cool. More health studies will come out showing that it's unhealthy. Uh, and part of that, the social aspect that once was with it will slowly diminish and go away. And so I don't see a lot of future longevity in their products because overall, any of the products that they have, I don't think are healthy for you. And I think that we're moving more to a time where people want to live longer. They want to have a healthier go on their journey here. And so I don't love the product for that reason either. Uh, aside from my specific concerns about the, the product, the dividend is a dividend safe. Now, a couple things that you can look at with this, the payout ratio of the companies. If they're below 60%, that's a pretty safe dividend that they have right there. If it's hiking up to 80%, 90%, if it goes over 100%, the payout ratio, if that's over 100%, that means a company is currently paying out more in dividends than it's taking in in, in net revenue. Uh, so that's unsustainable. It can do that for a while, but it can't do that forever. So look at that uh, as one indicator that you can look at. And then revenue growth. In order for a company to continue paying a growing dividend, it needs to have a growing revenue. So look and see if its net revenue is growing year over year, how it's uh, gaining a profit year over year. So. Uh, those are a couple things I'd look at with the dividend safety. I think I think these companies have been around for a long time, so they're pretty good at keeping their dividend paid, and they know that's pretty much the only reason that people are holding these companies. So they put a lot of priority on paying their dividend. I hope that gives you some ideas, though. I'll go ahead and leave this video there. Let me know what you guys think of the graph. Uh, you can leave some comments and feedback on it, and I'll try to make adjustments with it. Hope you guys have a great week. We'll see you.